What's up, fish peeps, bigs? Nine o'clock. I'm sitting in the middle of a hotel room. Got a couple of beers and a water. <laughs> Where's the fish peeps at? What do you guys want to haggle about? We're going to talk about fish breeding, I think, right? See, I'm trying this new service called StreamYards, as by uh, Mr. B. Oh, well, here we are. Corey Bruce, you guys figured it out, so apparently this is working. You can hear me fine, Corey. Hey, Frank. Can, uh, Corey and Frank, can you guys just give me a quick comment? Tell me if you can hear the audio fine and if uh, the stream is working and there's not, 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 not a lag. Wonderful. All right, guys. Only two of you so far. What do we want to haggle about? What are your guys' interests? Do you guys keep, obviously, you guys keep fish. What are you guys keeping? What are you breeding? What are you working with? Do you have any questions, any challenges, anything that I can help you guys with? You guys are my family tonight because I'm away. I'm in the middle of nowhere, nine hours from my family. My daughter's sick again at home she's constantly being sick she goes to daycare and i don't know how old you guys got kids when you send your kids to daycare they bring home every flavor of plague imaginable so now my wife is stranded at home for tomorrow we've got tons and tons of snow and uh it's just an absolute nightmare for her so i, I basically my heart wants to be home with my family and help my wife but i'm not able to do that because i still have a ton of work to do tomorrow I'm not what? What am I, Austin? I'm not what? <laughs> Liam, yes, I've bred lots of Corys. I used to breed Corys a fair bit. I've probably done, and I'm just guessing, I've probably done maybe 15, 20 species. Uh, I'm definitely not a Cory person. I tend to tend to badger people who are strictly into one genre of fish. I tend to be what I'd call myself a, a specialized generalist. And what I mean by that is I go through phases where I'll get hardcore into a group of fish and I'll work on them and work on them and work on them. And uh, I did this. Don't want to sound like I'm knocking people that are Cory breeders or Pleco breeders or anything. It's definitely not the case. I've bred a bunch of Plecos too. Maybe not the, the real exceptional ones that people are working with now, but uh, a lot of the Corys and I'm definitely, this is very, very generalized. Uh, let's say all the Corys that are in the trade, the average Corys that are in the trade, I would akin them to the Tanganyika and Trophius. Totally different methods of breeding, obviously, but uh, I akin them as if you've bred one Trophius, they pretty much all breed exactly the same way. Now, the really cool thing about South American fish, not just Cory's, but all South American fish, is they are all respondent to uh, one, two, three, or four, but they're all respondent to a certain amount of triggers, and triggers are always characterized as the, the factors of their environment. And what I mean by that is uh, everything that's South American is going to go through these different series of triggers. Seasonally, the, the Amazon Basin and all the other rivers, they're all going to change and fluctuate gra uh, greatly. Uh, the ice caps of the Andes are going to melt. With that, all that extra water is going to rush down the mountain and move into, into the water column. And that's going to bring with it cooler temperatures. So we often hear about reducing the water temperature of the fish. We also talk about prior to the prior to that in the rainy season that they, the water gets lower and lower and lower. Water gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And naturally, when you, when you get pools that dry out and stuff, it gets hotter and hotter. So when you get this huge influx of cold water, that's a trigger. The other factor is all that rushing water coming down the mountain surface is bringing all that detritus and organic matter and leaf litter and all the dead stuff and live stuff that happens to be on that. And you guys have seen some of my videos. I hope you've seen some of my videos, all the ones about the different isopods and those different things. Well, those are similar. Those are forest floor cleaners, those type of things, and all the little invertebrates and anything that's died, that's all going to be floor flushed into the water column. And that becomes not only a massive food source for all the different types of fish, so a great protein influx, all the leaf litter and everything is going to be all the organic matter that's going to crash the pH. It's going to uh, take gradually lower the, the oxygen potential of the water. All these things are different are, are different factors for, for breeding South American fish that need triggers. And a lot of the curries that they're bringing out nowadays, some of these really exceptional ones, especially 
if they're wild caught. They may not need only one trigger. You can breed Aeneas and Paleatis and most of your pet store, maybe even Sturbe and Panda Curries using one trigger. But nowadays, all these really, really sexy ones that they're pulling out of the Amazon, and I said that. I said sexy to Corey. So you catfish people out there, you guys know, I don't even want to hear about Nickelback. I don't even want to hear about that, Josh. It's just wrong. Even though I'm in Canada, we're not going to talk about Nickelback because it's just wrong. It's right up there with birds. But any of those Corey people that are really hardcore Corey people, they just love them. This one's got a, a slight shade of a hue of beige, and it's got one little spot over here. and it's, So it's totally different. They get all excited. That's ah, not me at all. With most, I did massively uh, lots of different stints with cor uh, with uh, killifish. I have a real strong passion for live bears, which is primarily based on wild live bears, as you guys have seen in some of my videos. And there's more coming out on different types of gadaids and whatnot. Uh, I did Tanganyika and cichlids long before it became a fad or it was cool back in the day when it was extremely challenging to get them out of the country and you got often mixed boxes and you didn't even know what you were getting and you had to kind of sort through all the stuff, much like you guys may be seen in some of the videos when I interviewed uh, uh, Rick down at Florida Exotic about uh, bringing uh, Malawi cichlids in in the very, very early 70s. So I like playing around, trying different things. One thing I am supposed to mention to you guys, I have no idea how it works. But I've been asked before about setting up something called Super Chat. And that's set up. I have no idea where it is. It's it's set up. And if it's there and you guys want to take care of it, by all means, go ahead and use it. Uh, I appreciate everything. And it's great. And I just love hanging out with you guys and chatting with you guys. Oh, we got some people from Saskatchewan in the house. Nice to see you guys. See, I, this is an entirely new format for me. Uh, Mr. B, who say he's going to chime in. He might be here already, and I might have missed him. He's here somewhere, possibly. But he's the one that asked me, he says, are you using something called StreamYards? And I basically said to the best bad, I, I don't even know what this. You can tell I'm old. I'm old. I'm not set in my ways, but I'm old. I'm not necessarily the brightest when it comes to tech things. I, I rely on my good friends like Austin and people like that that help me through and muddle through a lot of these things. Austin's badgering me because in my hotel room, I've stayed in the same hotel room in this hotel for 13 years or 12 years now and they give me the absolute deluxe suite and in my in my room over there i have a giant six foot hot tub and everything like that and he said oh you should do the the live feed from the hot tub i thought that'd be pretty funny <laughs> but i don't think my wife would appreciate that and i just make more of a fool of myself by doing stuff like that okay i don't even know how, how you did that austin so if you can tell me how that works i don't even know how that works but love you too brother he's one of my dearest here on our next Florida adventure. I'm heading down to Florida. One, because it's insanely cold where I live, and we're going to go down to, uh, I'm going to go down to Florida, and I'm going to be spending some time with Mr. Dan Sharifi and his lovely wife. we be there for a couple of days behind the scenes at Cichlids of the America, and I'm going to be bringing back an absolute ton of new footage that you guys have never seen. Most people don't know about it, but when Austin and me were there, neither of us had ever met him before doing that one video that we did on Cichlids of the Americas. And from what I understand from what he told me, we sat and we uh, we had some drinks and we sat on his patio and chatted for about two hours. And then we went and looked at the fish room. And prior to that, nobody had ever been allowed to do any video in his fish room whatsoever. He does things a little bit different than an average home, uh, home aquarist would do. And uh, it takes some time to figure those things out. And I'm hoping to bring some of his real, uh, from an expert level, I'm hoping to bring some of his tips and tricks to you guys. Because he does some things that I find even questionable, but they work very, very well for him. And he's doing it on a commercial scale because Cichlids of America is bringing fish to you guys. And then I get to spend the remainder of the week with the one and only, the absolute legend, the lady herself, Miss Sandy Moore, the president of Seagrest Farms. And we have got an absolute whole load of really cool stuff that we're going to do. I know everybody goes down there. It's a YouTuber, gets a tour of Seagrass Farms and shows you all stuff. And they do some great, great videos. I'm not knocking them whatsoever. But that's not my style. I like to put a more of a science edge to it or challenging edge. Or I like to push myself a little bit. So we've set up a bunch of really, really, really cool stuff. And uh, I don't even know what we've got going on. We've got all sorts of stuff set up, so we're pretty excited about it. So... I really need somebody to kind of direct me through this stuff. Thanks, Austin, man. You guys are you, you're super, super cool. I don't even know how it works. I don't even know where it goes. <laughs> it just sits there forever. <laughs> Busher Eye 
Busher Eye is, a, is an easy one, Cichlid Center. Busher Eye is no different than any of the, the other neolaprologines. Busher Eye, uh, when, they're, when they're growing up, they're, they're very, very, they're not really, they're not delicate. That's the wrong word. Delicate isn't the right word. Uh, they're a little bit more sensitive than maybe, say, Bouchard Eye or any of that grouping now. Uh, but when they do pair off, they are pretty, what I, I use the term waspy. They are pretty aggressive, but they breed exactly the same as every other neolamprologia. I'm sorry, the guys, there's a bit of waffle here. I had to low raise the, lap, the laptop up, and it's literally sitting on a giant bag of sphagnum moss that I bought at the garden center to take home because I wanted to raise it up. I'm in my hotel room. I didn't know what else. And every time I actually touch anything, it kind of wobbles a little bit. So don't think that Biggs is drunk because he hasn't even opened his beer yet. But we're going to take care of that right now. So... But busher eye breeds exactly the same as other than any of the other neolamprologines. Once they've got a mature pair, uh, it's it's a crevice spawner. So as long as you got some rock work, cave work, if you breed any Julies or any other neolaps, they'll breed the same way. The only uh, neolamprologine that I've never ever kept. Sorry, there's more than one. There are other um, uh, neolamprologines. Now that they've broken up Richard eye into about eight or ten species, there's several of them I may not have ever bred. I don't even know. And there's a few odds and ends, like some of the new Julies that have come out and things like that. There's some new ones there. I don't really know. I, I, if, if, but they're not going to breed any different than the others. There is one Neolamprologine, to my best of my knowledge, nobody in the world has bred yet. It's something that's a focus in one of my talks that I talk about all the time, is uh, uh, Neolamprologus uh, sex fasciatus, but the blue form. And the blue form, you almost never see it in the hobby anymore. It looks very similar to Tretocephalus. Has different amount of bands on the on, on, uh, that are there that traverse the body, uh, that touch the touch the dorsal fin. Everybody knows uh, Neolamprologus sex fasciatus, the yellow form with the brown stripes. This one looks blue and and kind of the blackish bands like a frontosa or a tretocephalus. But if you look at the lake, Lake Tanganyika is a giant chasm that goes up and down. And if this is the southern point and this is the northern part, these lakes just eventually just got bigger and bigger and bigger. But uh, the, the 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 yellow form lives. Right here, I don't even know how to do this on the phone or on the on the computer. So it lives right here, and it lives right here. It lives it's St. Patrick on both sides, the identical fish, the same species. DNA proves it's exactly the same fish. DNA also proves that the blue form, which lives in the bottom tip, is the same fish as well. It just happens to be a locale, and it looks completely different color-wise. Uh, the blue one has never been done before by anybody in the world, anywhere, anyone in the world. So... No idea. I worked with that fish for many, many, many years. Uh, I'm probably talking 17 years I worked with that fish. Wild caught specimens. I did dissections. I did everything to see if everything was viable. Uh, long before the internet was prevalent, I used to write letters back and forth to the governments to try and get rainfall patterns, uh, weather change patterns, lake temperature changes, everything. This lake is, is what they refer to as a benthic lake, and it doesn't actually turn itself over. And this is why that that the upper portions of the lake remain constant temperature wise. And then as you go down, it's a very, very gradual change. You got to go down to like way past where frontosas live in the hundred meter range before you're going to get a, a real temperature change. And the lake just goes down below and there's, and there's nothing below that except for bacteria and whatnot. But lost my train of thought. Tangany goes, Hey, I was positive for years that there had to be coming back to my science side. I had to be thinking that there was something about like an insect or something that would use the lake as its breeding grounds. And then the, the, the females more than likely would ingest that insect. And that would cause a chemical reaction within their body as a trigger for them to produce roe. And uh, that's what I was, I was hell bent on that as, as kind of a tentative solution, even though I had no method of, of proving that. Uh, and Mr. Ad Konings and a couple other really, really well-known uh, fish hobbyists or scientists or ichthyologists that have spent a, an amount of time in those lakes have uh, completely disproved that now. So Biggs is back to square one. But uh, Ad Konings has proven uh, without doubt that that fish breeds year-round without any question in that water. Now, Lake Tanganyika, also, it doesn't change temperature very, very much seasonally. It doesn't change its water chemistry. So everything that we just talked about about South America with all those triggers – all that is thrown out the door, and none of that means anything anymore when you're dealing with Rift Lake species. So I'm at an absolute loss as to what it is. I've had lots of discussions about it with many people, but to this day, I've never been successful in even the sexes acknowledging that there's boys and girls in the tank. So I don't know. Whatever. Maybe we'll try it again one day, but that fish is getting harder and harder to find because they just don't harvest it out of the lake anymore. And most of the area it comes from is actually protected habitat. So maybe it'll never happen. We don't really know. 
So what else are we talking about? Before I even got, hey, Susie Koo, Big City Bettas, all you guys. James Green, Mr. James Green, you are the gentleman that sent me all those questions. They are printed off. Uh, I apologize to you. I haven't had a chance. They're in my they're in my in pile. <laughs> Biggs isn't tech enough to have a, a, a virtual inbox. He has to actually physically print off a paper thing. But James posed me a bunch of questions months ago in a section in my on my YouTube that I completely missed replying to comments. And I've since print those all off. And yes, James, we will be getting to those questions. Uh, and, and you're right. It'll probably be something where we'll have one of my Into the Madness sessions where we'll rant and we'll talk all about all those things because some of the questions were right up my alley, all the science side and everything. And I absolutely love that. I have gotten answers to several of the questions already, and I've backed them up with people in the fields, one being Mr. Jason Wilson that works for Fritz Aquatics. So he's backed up a lot of the different information and gave me some more scientific side of it. So I do have all that stuff and it will be coming. Silver dollars. I have silver dollars. Oh, I did something. I have silver dollars with a 16 inch sail fin who I'm sure is enjoying caviar if the silver dollars are breathing. Silver dollars are a big kerosene. They breed no different than all the other kerosenes. They're, they're, Intermittent egg scatterers, they come together. I've bred, I think, three species of silver dollars. I've kept five species, and I know I know two for certain that I have not bred, but that's no, not necessarily a fault of the fish. It's also the fault that I may have not have ever gone and actually set them up to breed. To breed silver dollars or any kerosens in a, just a, a standard average aquarium with other fish, you're never going to have success. So you're right. Any fish in that tank would, would gladly take care of it. Uh, when they are mating silver dollars, if they're mature, you'll know it. Uh, they're like goldfish and koi. They're, they're, they're scatterers. And when they come together like a big, uh, a big uh, rubriprinus, like the red hook silver dollars, the ones I had were all of eight or 10 inches in size. I've seen them a lot bigger. Yeah, actually in Saskatoon right here where I am today, a dear friend, Mr. Dana Allen in his 1,200 gallon tank, he used to have uh, silver dollars that were well over 30 years old and they were the size of a full on dinner plate and they were just absolutely stunning. They're very, very sexually dimorphic. You can tell the boys and the girls based on their anal fins. Uh, and most, almost all the silver dollars are all that same way as how to sex the boys and the girls. But you won't be able to sex them at the pet store looking at babies. You're gonna have to buy eight or 10 as a group and grow them up and then let them sex out on their own and you'll see what you've got. And then I probably, if they're a bigger species, like something, you know, four inches, six inches sort of thing, I'd be using something like an old school 55, something like a three foot by eight, by, by 18 inch or 24 footprint as a breeding tank. Or even hit your up your like uh, your tractor supplies or farm feed stores and get like a horse trough and set them up that way. You know, heat stuff really decimate their own spawns when they breed. So you're going to have to have something. Yeah, uh, the carp industry, the koi industry, goldfish breeding industry sells all sorts of different types of mops. If you guys saw the episode that I made on those DIY mops, just making yarn and whatnot and using corks and stuff, you can easily just go to, to your Walmart or your Michaels or any of your hobby lobbies in the States and stuff and buy some acrylic yarn, green, brown, black. It's not going to matter to the fish. And just make night giant mops and throw them in there as, as receptacles. You could use live plants like java moss and all that sort of stuff, but that makes it a bit of a mess. So I don't know if that answers or helps you, hopefully. What else we got now? There's probably 200 questions since then. Sorry, guys, i got to fuddle my way through here. Don't forget the minute. Oh, that's she's telling other people. Guiana Caradacra. You can't seem to get them breeding. Do you keep them in water? They're like the convicts of South America. <laughs> Jim Cummings uh, breeds them up here. I don't think he keeps them at all anymore because they were just insanely overly prolific, and they were just, just ridiculous in how much they would breed. Uh, there's no difference in they're, they're just a platform spawner. So they're easy to, they're no difference in that. I'm not discrediting the fact that you have it, but if we're going to talk about breeding water is the number. It's also the one factor that we as aquarists can work with. Um, my challenge since I've moved is I'll be honest, I have not bred a lot of fish in my new fish room. The reason I have not bred a lot of fish is the fish that I can breed. I breed in, RO water, reverse osmosis water that I make myself. I make about 180 gallons a day and uh, it's not automated right now. Uh, automation for me sometimes is awesome when I'm using city mains pressure and I'm using my automatic water changers and I've done them for 30 plus years and I've never had any issue. But since I've moved out into the country, uh, for me to do the, the automated system the way I'm used to using it, 
and using the RO is I'd also have to have a pressure pump, a reservoir, and then I'd have to do other things. It's totally doable. It's just not really my wheelhouse. And I like the idea of actually doing the manual wire changes and being there because it gets my eyes right on the fish and I get to see it because I travel all the time. I don't get to see the fish as much. Now, the problem I'm faced with is all the species that tolerate hard water, all my centrals and a lot of my live bears and stuff like that. Some of them have not replicated well for me in my well water. My well water is exceptionally hard, high in calcium, high in all those things, and that's awesome. The problem I'm faced with is anybody that lives out in the country that has a well is invariably, I, I'm going to tell you, with probably 90%, 90% percentile, is that most well water coming from the ground is going to have a high iron content. Now, a normal level of iron will be okay, and it won't affect the fish's breeding whatsoever. But if you have an insanely high level of iron, like I do, the point that all our white tile and our toilets and sinks and everything are constantly getting stained, uh, and the water softener has to run constantly to take care of that, and we have to do flushes all the time, I think my iron levels are far too high, and I think that's causing problems for the fish being able to breed. So I could go ahead and put an iron system on the house, which is the idea that we're looking at doing. But for me to do that for the fish is, is completely cost prohibitive. To do it for the whole house and save the job for my wife, we could definitely do that. But we're looking at it. It's, it's almost a four to four thousand, four thousand to forty five hundred dollar bill to add that to our house. And that's just something that just hasn't been in the cards because everything else has been working fine. So where are we here? Do I participate in any local bat programs? Uh, yes, Frank. I've been uh, I've, I've helped many clubs work with bat programs over the years. I've helped many clubs develop or modernize their bat programs for many, many years. I'm one of the founders of the Aquarium Society of Winnipeg. There was originally eight of us that founded the club. It had been uh, defunct for many, many years ago, and then we re-brought it back. And this is in, I'm going to think, probably 86 or something. And I took on the task of developing a Breeders Award program. Was it all mine? No, definitely not. It was it was taken from a lot of real successful clubs and people that I known through the speakers circuit because I was doing talks back in the day at those time frames. I was actually on the Marineland speaker program or the Tetra speaker program many, many years long before it became the ZooMed speaker program back in the day when everything was all slides. <laughs> That's how old Biggs is. <laughs> but uh, uh, the local, my local club, my Aquarium Society of Winnipeg, it's near and dear to my heart. But my problem is, is my traveling schedule, my younger family with all the kids. Uh, it kind of keeps me on the road a lot. And invariably, if I take on a speaking engagement, it always falls on those weekends or something. And it always ends up being the same weekend. So I know in this calendar year, there's only two meetings that I could attend if I wanted to out of an entire calendar year. It makes it a bit challenging. But I think a Breeders' Award program for a club is an absolute instrumental tool for encouraging and rewarding membership. I'm very, very much an advocate for of giving back. And I'm not talking as an individual. I'm talking as an organization like a fish club, always finding ways to give back to your membership. I don't drink coffee. Uh, you drink coffee, it's good for you. Biggs doesn't drink coffee. But if, if it only costs $20 every month, to go and buy coffee, sugar, whatever all the, the accoutrements that you need for making coffee and your club goes to your Costco or Sam's Club and buys one of those giant stainless steel, I don't know how many gallons it is, uh, or things for making coffee, good, do that. Buy that as a club asset, offer coffee because the whole thing is that it's encouraging the members to sit around, socialize, have a cup, relax, and talk about the things that we love talking about. Exactly why every one of you guys is here tonight. I even see people here, my lovely friend Cheyenne, you guys know Cheyenne from uh, Species Canada. She is my uh, she's my pusher. She's my hookup for all the isopods. You guys, uh, even if you're just into fish, go check out those videos. Go check out Species Canada. You will not find more amazing people than these guys. They're absolutely epic. Now, when I'm getting back to what I was talking about, about the, the, the clubs, is anything you can give back to your membership. In the local clubs, I can only talk about what I have up here, but in the local club, we have a bat program, we have a hat program. Our bat program has many different facets and levels. There's a junior program, there's a cares program. A lot of those facets have evolved and come after I've been out of that club for many, many years, and I've recently gone back. So the program that I originally tabled has been changed drastically over the years. There's some factors that I really, really love about it, and there's some factors I completely disagree with, uh, but that's personal choice, and every single one of you guys has your own personal choice. <laughs> Get out, Matt. 
<laughs> who's Matt? Which one's Matt? <laughs> who are we going to, who are we badgering? Who's Matt? We got to bug Matt. Who's Matt? But regardless, it's a method of giving back. In Canada, not only do we have our local BAP, but we have this great organization called KOAC, Canadian Association of Aquarium Clubs. And that organization is going through a whole new rebirth. And that's awesome. Uh, and they are there to assist and enhance all the local clubs. And they have programs as well, where if you're only into keeping Killies or Corys or whatever, that you could specialize and get awards for specializing in those things. And I think that's a great compliment to everything that everybody's doing. Is that good? Did we answer the questions? We don't even know. I'm going to have to scroll back a little bit here, guys. I really need to join the Ohio Cichlid Association. Well, I, I, every time, every, I, usually once a year, I go there and I speak, and then they sign me up and they give me their newsletter every year. I have many, many, many dear friends in the Ohio Cichlid Association. I was there. I was beyond honored to be one of their speakers at this past November for their big uh, uh, 25th anniversary show, and it was over-the-top amazing. There's, there's no better group for putting on an absolute kick-ass convention than the Ohio Cichlid Association. Am I working with or considering working with anything off the CARES list? Well, I've worked with many, many of them off the CARES list long before the CARES list existed. Currently at home right now, though, I would have probably four species of live bear that would be on the CARES program. And I'd probably have a couple of cichlids that would be on the CARES program as well. But I'm also, you guys have seen kind of my, my fish room. It's somewhat limited for what I've got. And right now, half the fish room is kind of uh, in staging phase, getting ready for the projects that are coming that are supposed to have started soon as winter hit. But we've just been inundated with one challenge after another this winter. And a lot of those projects are still going to happen. It just It's taking a lot longer to get them off the ground than I anticipated. Susie knows what I'm talking about when I talk about slides. The plecos asked me not to change anything. The plecos are great. They'll love that. Yeah, so I'm on the Zoom Ed Speakers program now. Now, if you guys have an organization, an aquarium club that you're a part of, and you want to bring a speaker out to, I'm not saying myself, there's lots of amazing speakers out there. Uh, my speaking, uh, my, my schedule, I'm already booking into 2023. Uh, and it's not because I'm the most critically acclaimed speaker out there. I'm definitely not. Uh, but uh, because I travel for a living away from my home constantly for my job means I can only take on so many speaking engagements outside of that. And I got so many. I have some that I go to consistently because I have so many dear friends and I have such a great time. But every year I try to add in some more, some new clubs that I haven't seen or go to some different demographics. And that was really one of the facets for launching the YouTube thing is I got to travel so much with my job to see a lot of interesting stuff. And I also get to travel with the speaking stuff as well to come see a lot of you. And I get out in nature all the time. It's one of the tags that I always uh, I always use. It may not be a popular tag because Biggs has no idea what he's doing when it comes to Instagram and tags. I don't have a clue. I have four daughters. You think they could help me a little bit with that sort of stuff? They know Dad is absolutely an idiot when it comes to this stuff, and they just kind of shake their head at Dad. But I use one all the time that's called Explore the World Around You. And I could, I could literally spend an hour just outside in my yard in the pasture, and I could come up with something that I think is really, really cool that I want to share with you guys. You might not think it's cool, but it's cool. Okay. Let's get back to some of these ones. Matt. Is that Matt from New Jersey? No bug Matt. Hey, Matt, learn to barbecue. Where's your barbecue channel? Ventralis. You're the hat chairperson for my club. Which club is that, Frank? Oh, you're Regina. Kyla Gould. So you're from Regina then, Frank. You guys are faced with lots of challenges in Regina if you're doing the hat program because <laughs> your water is like liquid rock. New comments. How do we even get to them? Oh, look at all this stuff, guys. Look at all this stuff. Biggs is learning. See, you can teach old dogs new tricks a little bit. My wife, don't tell my wife that. If you're going to suggest a CARES list type fish for a young novice with a small tank, less than 10 gallons, what would you suggest? 
Uh, there's many, many, many live bears that could easily fit that bill. If it's a small 10 gallon tank, I, I would avoid some of the, the, the Gadeids. Most of them are going to be too rambunctious for such a small tank. Uh, but there's lots of them that you could do there. Peel Region Aquarium Society in the G Greater Toronto area. I think I, I'm I am in Hamilton in April for a dinner program, and I'm doing two talks, I believe. <laughs> As Mike just clearly pointed out. <laughs> so, what other fish we want to talk about, guys? You know, Biggs likes to ramble. This is honestly the first live feed I've ever done that actually we've actually actually held some sort of a topic focus. That's pretty cool. Sometimes I have no idea where it's going to go. We could be talking about birds or Star Wars or anything. It could go all over the place. How, here's a random question for you guys. Out of the people that are on right now, and I have no way of knowing, I don't think, how many people are on. It doesn't show me that anywhere. And if it does, I don't know where to see it. But out of the people that are on here right now, how many people – a yes or no have watched my videos on isopods and just say yes or no to that. But also as a two part, did you enjoy them? Were you intrigued by them? This is say, Hey, those are really cool. Are we just going, Oh, those are just stupid bugs. Answer 32, 33 people. Is that good? Yes. Look at all. No, no. Why don't you watch them? You should watch them. They're super cool. <laughs> Lake Tanganyika and feather fins. Lake Tanganyika and feather fins. You're talking like the cyanthopharynx and boops and ventralis and all that sort of stuff. Everybody talks about these things being super, super aggressive. The problem is they don't blossom into their real prettiness and their beautiful self until they're bigger and bigger. Uh, if I wanted to keep them, now I've bred, I've bred probably a couple of types of first before I know I have for sure. I, 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 I recognize locales, but I don't recognize the species as much. And I know I've done boots, and I know I've done the Sudis tiger, and I know I've done, is it Ventralis, the one that's like the baby blue? And some of these I've done in like 25-gallon tanks and stuff without any issue. Now, that I remember these are all going back in the day. Now, if it were me today and go and, uh, and, go and do feather fins, the way I keep fish now is a bit different than the way I used to keep them before. Keeping before, I had a massive fish room. I had 150 plus tanks. Uh, everything, a lot of it was automatic. Prior to the automatic, everything was manual. I had a giant 50 gallon rolling brute bucket for doing water changes. I had an inch and a half hose for doing water changes. And it was breed, 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 breed. And that's what it was. And I worked through everything. I go to the Saskatoon Aquarium Society, which is eight hours from my home, which is where I am tonight. And I go to their auction every year or their show. So Regina was the alternate show, alternate year. I done, and sometimes I travel and go different. It's like the Minnesota Aquarium Society was about eight hours. And back in the day when you could transport fish across borders without any issue and stuff. And I would always just go and see what was there. New killies, new corys, new rainbows, new abana bantoids, whatever it was, I'd find all sorts of stuff and I'm bringing it back and I was working with everything. And I had lots of favorites at the time and I have lots of favorite fish and lots of fond memories of the different stuff. But the way I keep fish now is a little bit different. And uh, I, I'm very, very strongly focused in trying to set up more naturalized type habitats, much larger tanks than the species would ever normally be kept in in a home aquarium, much bigger environments and stuff. And I like setting them up that way. So when we talk about feather fins, we're, we're going to do this at one of the farms. The farmer's given us the okay, but he knows it's going to be an absolute massive pain in the ass once it's done. He had Rick Burrow at the Florida Exotic, and I've shown you guys, we've done a few interviews with him like a full tour video with him and stuff but i have just have so much footage from that place for so many years it's a chance to put it some together cohesive but he breeds a lot of the first of her types in these specialized concrete vaults that he's made that are like eight foot by 16 by three tall and what we want to do is we want to literally dump a dump truck's worth of sand in one of these things and actually let the males build their bowers and do it properly. If you have a 180 gallon group, eight or 10 or 12, one of these type of feather fins and you throw them in that tank with nothing else, uh, it's, it, it, trust me, within a month, it'll be absolutely breathtaking and fascinating behavior of what you're going to see. 
the, the, the two dominant males will start staking out the two corners and they will literally build a bower of sand in a two foot tall tank that might be four inches from the top of the tank if they've got enough stuff to do it. And it'll have a big concave bowl at the top and then that male will light up and that will become his spot. And that's more my fascination of keeping fish is to get these replicate as best as I can, these natural environments to get them to replicate their natural behaviors in the wild. Can you breed these guys in, in a hundred gallon tank with a bear, bear tank with a matten filter or a sponge filter or a canister? Definitely. They'll breed on the bottom. They'll breed on a rock. They'll do all that stuff because these things are all been in captivity for a while. But uh, if you give them these types and see behavior, Behaviors, trust me, I think you'll be hooked just as much as I am. All the little sand sifters and dwellers like the uh, Enanotopius types, the Chilinochrom, or not Chilinochromus, Calichromus, the Enotilapius, all those type of things. Add a lot of sand to the tank and far more than you think you should, and you will absolutely love it. Her name is Cheyenne, and uh, Cheyenne and her husband Ivan they run, uh, so, uh, sorry, Supreme Gecko, you're asking about the isopod videos. Her name is Cheyenne and her husband is Ivan. Uh, and uh, uh, they run the, the company called Species Canada. You can find it on Facebook. Go find it. You can find them on Instagram. Instagram's, it's newer to me because Biggs is not a tech guy and Biggs doesn't know how to do the tags thing and his kids won't help him because they just think it's funny. Uh, but uh, on her Instagram page, she posts absolutely tons of stuff. So if you want to see really obscure Asian rat snakes, uh, some obscure venomous stuff, and the absolute mo one of the most outstanding isopod collections, definitely probably the most outstanding one in Canada. And I, I can't really say otherwise. I haven't seen a lot of other ones, but the amount of species these guys are working with and thriving and replicating them, like they've got enough to supply everybody. These guys are absolutely awesome. So I suggest if you, if you have any interest in it whatsoever, I just found it as a, uh, a companion, like if you with freshwater, freshwater shrimp came in about what about 10, 15, 20 years ago, and all of a sudden they came out. And there was the japonica, the little mano shrimp, which everybody started throwing in their planted tanks, and then all of a sudden all these other species started coming out uh, these reds and the cherry shrimps, and all these other things. And everybody they took, took the world by storm, and now they're their guys are breeding them in every flavor under the rainbow and making some absolutely amazing, outstanding stuff, and that's really cool. Isopods to me were the logical progression from that because that's the landform. They're still crustaceans, and I just think it's absolutely cool. I think they're fascinating. And the nice thing about them is, for me, with my amount of my traveling schedule, it's not like I've set up 15 or 20 new aquariums that need water changes and stuff. I've set up 15 or 20 shoebox-style Rubbermaid things like you guys have seen in the video, and I keep them all individual species, and I have the steel mesh screen so nothing can get mixed up and stuff. And uh, I think they're absolutely amazing. And uh, I, every time I go and see them, it's dangerous because I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. They, they've got it to the point where she'll just put stuff aside and say, just show Biggs those. <laughs> just send those home to Biggs. And he just, it's just, okay, <laughs> tell me whatever I need to do. So I just think it's cool. I hope you guys think it's cool too. Yeah, Biggs is being an idiot up in here. That's what he's doing. He's being, he's being an idiot. Isopods, we did that. Now, Corey is asking about getting for caddis rainbows to breed. That's one of the little blue eyes, right? Uh, they need impeccably clean water. Uh, I may be wrong. I haven't kept them in a long time, but a lot of the different blue eyes, uh, a lot of them can tolerate fairly high levels of salt. Uh, some, of, Several of them are, are true estuary species that actually inhabit areas that uh, have a lot of silt, uh, salt, uh, and uh, like brackish areas. Uh, I was just watching on uh, my good friend there from uh, from Australia, Total Tropical TV, Jason. He just did a video where he was out in the area, and I believe it was for Caddy in his second video in that series on Total Tropicals TV, uh, where he was exploring different areas of Australia with underwater footage. And this one area he was collecting Matt McCulloch and he was collecting, I believe it was for Cata. I may be wrong, and I apologize if I am, but I believe it was rain, uh, that and he says there's actually a fair concentration of salt in that water. And they, they are very, very cautious about collecting there because the, the saltwater crocs use that area as a breeding ground. So <laughs> that's an animal I might give a wide berth to. Not the fricata, but the, the, the saltwater croc. And I love that video. The second video he put out is absolutely epic because he has this whole section. And, you know, Biggs, 
doesn't love birds. Birds are food, not friends. Uh, but uh, I love badgering people about birds. And he actually found a cassowary, like a wild cassowary. And if you guys don't know what a cassowary is, look it up. It's the most dinosaur looking bird on our planet. It's got velociraptor type feet. They're huge with massive claws. They can cut you open and kill you in a heartbeat. And this guy gets out of his car and wanders up within like 20 feet of one to do a video. <laughs> I think it was absolutely priceless. I'm like, I don't know if Biggs would do that, but it was a cool video. <laughs> okay, where are we up to? Would be cool if you could display them more like an ant farm. Now you're talking about the isopods. Now, in the isopods, there's many different groups. Same as fish, there's many different genera and whatnot. Every, uh, in, in the isopods, the main group that everybody usually gets into is a genera called Persilio. And that's all your common isopods, your Lavis and all the different types and all the ones that are the perfect starter isopods. The ones that everybody gets enamored with and gets really all excited about and sexy are the ones that are generally called Kubaris. And they all come out of limestone caves in Thailand predominantly. And the one everybody knows in the trade is the one called Kubara species rubber ducky. And it looks like a rubber duck. The face of it is bright yellow with an orange bill like thing. And everybody knows, everybody gets excited. But these things are often selling sometimes for a small culture of 10 juveniles for somewhere upwards of like, you know, 250, three, four hundred dollars and stuff like that. And they're finding all sorts of really super cool new ones all the time. Now, when you say that, you know, it'd be really cool if you could set out and different something like that. I do have the idea of taking Kubaris, some of the Thailand species Kubaris, once I've gotten them going and doing a bit better, I have the idea of actually putting them into more of a vivarium style thing and giving them something like Texas Holy Rock or trying to break some stuff down, maybe get some limestone powder or something and making kind of a fake cave or something like that. So we could experience them a little bit differently, a bit more natural. The problem with keeping them is a bit different than keeping any of the ones that used to be uh, like that, like everyone's used to feeding them leaf litter and stuff like that. So we use oak leaves, and cork bark and oak bark, and they break all these things down and long sphagnum, sphagnum mosses and whatnot. But most of these Kabara species that live in these Thailand limestone caves, there's none of that in the caves. The only thing that's on the, on the floor in that cave is bat poo. <laughs> that's true it's guano so that's what they're going to get that will be super acidic so maybe they're, they're, they're finding some nourishment out of that and i've seen like you can go to a high-end uh, garden centers you can often buy organic potting soil you can buy worm casting potting soil but i have seen on the internet bat guano additives for soil and that's kind of an idea that i think i'd like to look at too and i'm really really excited on one of my trips to the states to be able to bring home a bag through customs of bat poo. I just think it'd be absolutely an epic video to be able to come through with a, ball, a bag of bat poo and just to be able to try it and see what happens. <laughs> 60 different groups? You're insane. <laughs> you got 60 different types? That's crazy. I don't want, I don't have the space for 60 different types. Uh, I think we're, I don't know, we're at 15 or 20 now. I don't even know. I don't have no idea. But the real cool thing about them, and honestly, the honest thing that, that, that I love about the ice pods the most is that my youngest daughter, uh, Paisley, is completely enamored with them. She actually got a little isopod toy for Christmas, and uh, she, she loves that toy. And she when I went to uh, Species Canada the last time, uh, I actually got a culture of Porcelio Lavis dairy cow. That's what they call them. Uh, Porcelio Lavis is the absolute ideal one for starting with isopods. And uh, they replicate extremely fast. And you can get them where they're orange and beige and all these different uh, different forms and stuff. But the one that my daughter absolutely loves is called dairy cow. And it looks like a dairy cow. It's kind of a white and it's got these little mottled black spots all over and patches all over it and stuff. And they replicate really, really fast. And my daughter absolutely loves that. So I don't have a problem giving her those and letting her hold one of those, you know, in full well that they're going to replicate really quickly versus giving her the most rarest one that we have and putting it in her hand and all of a sudden it falls on the ground, you know? <laughs> so we like working with the ones that work best for her. Worm castings in your aquarium too. We do have a video. Kyle um, Kyle is, is often in the live feeds here. He's a good friend from just north of Winnipeg. Uh, me and him have been planning on doing a video series together for a while and I've been amassing all the stuff in the background. I think I alluded to, to it in one of my videos and we're gonna do a high-end version of a dirted aquarium. 
This guy takes a dirted aquarium to an entirely new level. You can go and buy a bag or two of the fancy Tropica mix or any of those type of engineered soils, ADAs and that sort of stuff. You can buy the big bag for about a hundred bucks in Canada and it's all engineered and it's got all the magic and everything in the bag and you throw that in there and do your stuff on top and then you go with that. Great. Or you can go the other method where you can buy $400 worth of additives and muds and products and different things that I don't even know what the hell they're for and I just pile them up in my garage until we're ready to go. And I'm sure it's going to be absolutely amazing. But every once in a while, I'm at the garden center. I'm looking at this stuff, and I have to send them a text. I'm like, is this how much this is supposed to cost? That's insane. It's mud. But we're going to have some fun. Night, Peter. Thanks for coming out, man. There, yeah, my daughter calls. Them. Those are her isopods. She knows those. Those are her isopods. Oh, yeah, don't forget to hit that like button, guys. I appreciate, you know, like, I I know I say it all the time, but I'm so new to this. I don't care if I've got 10 followers. I don't care if I've got 200 followers. I absolutely just love doing this. I think it's fun. I love sharing the stuff. And the fact that you guys are enjoying what I'm putting out there, that just that touches me, man. I just think that's really, really cool. I don't honestly know on the live feed uh, as to when this is going to become a regular thing. Uh, Big Rich, uh, uh, Josh and Tracy at Ohio Fish Rescue, they offered the opportunity for me to follow in between them and Lucas Bretz. Legends. Both these guys are legends. Big, big things. And I'm, I'm, I was, I'm beyond honored. The last live chat was the first time I'd ever done it was that Friday. And I got to tell you, the minute that chat ended, it was so incredibly emotional for me. I literally sat in the room in silence for about 10 minutes. And then I went upstairs and my wife knew something was wrong. Nothing was wrong. I was just emotionally shocked at, uh, at all the all the comments and everything. I was just blown away. It's like I was at a fish convention in my basement and chatting with people and everything like that. So I thought it was really, really cool. But the one thing I didn't do is I didn't stay and watch Lucas's talk. And that has bothered me to this day. So this Friday... We're going to go and do it again. I'm going to be in the middle there in between those two legends. I can. I always, I always try to chime in and see, see uh, Big Rich and the guys. And I'm going to chime in, and we're going to see Lucas, and he's going to offer his whole thing. I know I'm going to see him in two months. We're speaking together in Raleigh, North Carolina. I'm super pumped about that. But i got to make very certain that I'm supporting the people that are supporting me. And I know that becomes a challenge. For any of you that do YouTube, you kind of get where I'm coming. For people that don't, YouTube is a challenge. It's it's somewhat alienating. You spend so much time away from family and friends, editing, videoing, doing all this stuff. It's it's kind of a different, it's a weird thing. I spend so much time on the road. So when I'm on the road, I'm in Saskatoon right now. I often don't get the opportunity to see a lot of my friends here in Saskatoon. It's not that they're not there. It's that the Biggs isn't there. The Biggs is constantly working on this sort of stuff. So Biggs has to find that happy medium of being able to deliver stuff that you guys are enjoying and being available to you guys. And so I'm also available to my friends. And more importantly, I'm available to my family. And I don't know how the, the, the Friday night one, as much as I love doing it, that, that specific time slot. Travel. I get home on the Friday, and uh, on the Friday is usually uh, the day where I want to spend time with my family and stuff like that. I just get home. My wife doesn't get home till about six, and then I got to go on and do the live feed at seven or eight or whatever it is. And uh, I don't even get to put my daughter to bed, my youngest daughter to bed, who's very much mom and dad's little daughter. She wants to be with me because uh, she hasn't seen me, and I just don't like that. So I don't know what the time's going to work. I was talking with Mr. B, and he showed me all these different times where everybody's on, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes. There's so many absolute legends out there. I'm just a little tiny peanut guy coming in there and saying, hey, let's talk about fish. There's so many absolute legends out there, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes. You guys are insane. River Life. Thanks, dude. Really appreciate that, man. Now, River Life, you got to give me a question. Tell me something. Make me do something. Make me... You know what we got? I'm not going to do it tonight because I'm in a hotel. But who who here was in the in the the, the live feed last Friday? Maybe this will happen this Friday. I don't really know. But last Friday, you guys were badgering me and talking about farm animals and all sorts of stuff like that. And uh, I told my wife, I says, 
if the super chat thing takes off, we're going to get everybody competing on the super chat. We'll see what happens with it and stuff. We'll get Biggs to do the peacock call. And I go to the local zoo and I've been to different nature sanctuaries. I've been down in Florida where they had them wild and stuff and people didn't believe it, but I do this, this peacock call that is insanely loud. So that's why I'm not doing it in a hotel, but I can call onto the male peacocks and they'll generally reply. <laughs> and it's just obscure. My wife absolutely hates it when we go to the zoo together because of it, but maybe that's something we can use. Get the super chat going. It's like ringing a bell. I don't know. Biggs will be a peacock because he's an absolute idiot. Lucas is coming down to Phoenix, Arizona in April. Don, is that are you a member of that club, or is that is that something else? Is that like a, an aqua sheller, or is that some other big convention or something? I don't know. But uh, Phoenix, Arizona is an area I've not been to in a long time. Uh, I would love to go again. I want to go when it's cold where I live. <laughs> but I also want to go with somebody that wants to uh, go out uh, and out in the wild. And the last time I was there, I was out there collecting uh, Western diamondbacks and I brought back a large female years and years and years and years ago. And I had her for many, many years. She was an absolute wonder and a pleasure to work with insanely dangerous and insanely waspy, but uh, she was a wonderful, wonderful serpent. So I'd love to be able to do that in March at that one, that convention that's coming up in Raleigh, North Carolina on the Friday, we're going to do uh, uh, a collecting trip on Friday. And they've got wicked cool fish out there, stuff that all our fish up in Canada are all like dinosaurs and evil, and they kill everything and giant mows and stuff. But they got all these cool darters, and pumpkin seeds and stuff like that. But what they also didn't, they failed to mention, part of the collecting trip is, you know, if you're going to be near a river in the wild, there's going to be woods. And in the woods, they have five amazing venomous snakes in Raleigh, North Carolina. So <laughs> we'll see if we can find some snakes for that too, because I think that'd be part of it. <laughs> I don't know if it would work or not. Venice, Florida. We asked, I asked you this before, Father Fish. How far away is that from where the Pasco County Aquarium Society is? Because that's, that's where I'm going to be right away. I don't know how far away they. I don't even know where the Pasco Aquatic Club is away from Tampa. I just know I'm flying into Tampa. I don't know where anything is. Reptile guy is fish guy. Don Gallagher is my new friend. Don Gallagher, if you're on Facebook, you should find me and we should be friends because we're two peas in a pod. I love that. Wicked. Two hours. So you're going to come and badger me? You're going to come heckle me, Father? I can refer to you as Father the whole time. If you wish, I would have no problem doing so. We are one hour south of Tampa. You are. Oh, okay. Cool. All right, guys. Yes, and tractors. <laughs> okay. Badger me. Give me something else. Give me some questions. Love you, Austin, man. You're killing me, dude. Absolutely killing me. Yes, you're right. It is original 16 because I am in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. This beer is a local beer. It's a copper ale and it's the original 16. And it was a brewery that almost vanished. I only know it from the commercials. It almost vanished and 16 employees invested and bought the company. And they've now come out and they've started producing beer. I don't know how many types of beer they have, but this one is delicious. Cheers. I'm not singing you happy birthday. Go away. It's not even your birthday today. Lucas should come to Edmonton. Great weather here. You can bring him up, Chris. Luke, Lucas travels a lot doing speaking engagements. I think Lucas would love to come to Edmonton, but, you know, I can't speak for him. He's a great, great guy. It's, his, his brain is like Rain Man. He's an exceptionally – he's an absolute virtual encyclopedia, so he's absolutely a wonderful, wonderful person. How do you feel about long, thin fish? Um, I don't, I, the, the thing I don't like about long fin fish is it seems to be most of the long fin variants that they keep coming out with are all the fish that definitely should not be long fin. <laughs> Rosy barbs, beautiful. They're in a, in a planted tank, in a pet store, in your tank, I think they're great. White clouds, breathtaking. Oscars, no. 
arowanas. I saw some video on Facebook. They got like long fin arowanas now. Like really? No, stop. Just stop all that. Ever had puppers? What is puppers? Is that a beer? I don't even know what we're talking about. Puffers? Like the fish or beer? Puffers, I've kept puffers. I've bred, I believe, three species. The one from Thailand that's called the pig nose puffer, pea puffer, and I can't remember if it was the figure eight or the green spot, but I've bred three. I've worked with others. When I was in New York, speaking at the awesome club in New Jersey, uh, North Jersey Aquarium Society, they took me inside to a store that was like, I've never seen anything like this before. Granted, you know, I'm sheltered. I live in Canada and we don't have as many awesome, awesome fish stores around. But uh, they took me to this place called Monster Aquarium in the Bronx. <laughs> that store was insane, the stock that they had. And I ended up coming home with five, I can't remember the name of them, but they were a puffer that sat on the bottom. It wasn't Bailey. It had all these appendages and stuff. I found the name online, but I don't remember it. But I had, I had very, very little success. They were wild imports. Uh, one didn't make the trip home, so I ended up with four. And I kept them for probably over a year, and they just – they never really thrived. And I really didn't have – I didn't really know why. Tried everything, but they just never really thrived. Oh, Swift, that's Kelly. That's Kelly from Regina. How's it going, buddy? I got to come back to your place. We got to do more video of that one Coriodorus because it's very challenging for me to put out a video on, on one specific Coriodorus that I definitely want to tell the really amazing story behind it when I have eight minutes of footage of a Cori sitting completely still in the tank and not moving. That makes it very, very challenging. <laughs> You guys are going all over the place here. I like albino fish. I do. Uh, and albino paradise fish is a fish that I've won. Uh, I won two or three times best of show with an albino paradise fish. I kept it in a really weird tank. It was about three feet long by eight or 10 inches by eight or 10 inches. The whole thing was planted and sponge at the back. It was ideal for them. And for breeding them, I often just used uh, so I could remove the spawn for, not for them as much, but for like hoplo cats and things that would spawn on a platform. Uh, I used a styrofoam coffee cup. And I just cut it in half and float half in the tank. They'd spawn on it. And I just lift it out and put it in the fry rearing tank and it worked great. But uh, I do have a video coming out in my uh, Into the Mind of Madness series and it's one really, because I've had a few videos that have come out of late uh, that have uh, started these uh, uh, <laughs> badgering of people going back and forth. One was on uh, the Herichthys minklii where people just went to war on it. And I'm like, hey, go to war. I don't care. Because it's not me saying yes or no or it's so fact or this is what this is or that is and stuff. It's basically me approaching people, experts in the field putting a video and giving them a voice out of something and bringing it to the hobbies on a different level of something they didn't do. And that one just went crazy. Everyone started going all over the world with that one being insane. And the other one was on uh, the Montezuma Sword Tales, which were filmed here in Saskatoon at a very, very dear friend, Mr. Kevin Cashel's tank. And I'm, you guys may have seen that video. I think they're breathtaking. I'm super stoked that I brought some home. But no, they haven't been selectively called to make bigger, what all that sort of stuff, because these are wildlife bears. These are not, I'm not trying to develop a new strain. I want them to be wild. And I want to, I brought home a group of eight, and they're going to go into the 12 foot tank desperately. But it takes a weekend. It takes a whole day on one weekend. And I've been away a lot. So I guarantee it's not going to be this weekend. <laughs> but it's coming. Uh, I brought home a few new plants from my good friend, Mr. Spencer Jack and Aficionados the other day. I threw them in there. And I want to go in that tank and tear it completely apart right down to the to the base. And I want to catch all the Xenotoka lion's eye out of it, which is a, a care species, Gdead live bear. It's very closely related to... Um, Xenotoka isoni, which is the red tail gadead. It looks just slightly different. There's a few species now they've broken them up and people if they maintain them and they want to know which one is which. But I want to take those out of there. And in that tank, I want to throw the Montezumas in there and get them going a little bit more prolifically. And the really cool about thing about the Zafafras Montezuma is they don't predate on their young, which is awesome. Where else are we here, guys? So, Kelly, I don't know when I'm going to be back in Regina, but we're coming back to see you. And I would love to come and see you too, Kayla. 
I don't know where you guys are. You're not even in Regina, you said. You're in some weird little town or something. Chewy loves albinism. I don't even know what that means. Oh, in guppies. I'm glad you cleared that up because it's not like you're looking for, you know, a, a certain mate or something yourself. Thanks, Mike. Now, the, thank you for the con. The, the video about the medications was amazing. I thank you very, very much for that. That video caused a fair bit of controversy as well. And I, I, I got to be honest, I've been, I've been told by some of the powers that be in the industry that there's some things within that video that are incorrect. And I very much do not ever want to be the one that brings incorrect information to it. And uh, the, 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 head, the, the head guy at API has extended the olive branch and he wants to have the conversation and he's even invited me down there. And uh, the only reason I haven't reached out to him yet is I just haven't been able to. But I do want to revisit that, and I do want to put out the actual facts behind it. Uh, I don't believe the second part to the video on Fish Can Fly has come out. I think that might come out. I don't know what comes out tomorrow. But I have videos already scheduled and posted all the way through till the middle of February. And if something more current or pertinent comes out, I can put it out right away and schedule it. Like the one that came out on Tuesday about my amazing hotel aquarium, that one was filmed back in like September or October. And it just it just was just kind of what I call a filler video of Biggs being an idiot. And that one just kind of got pushed back and it ended up coming out today or Tuesday. But uh, the other one, uh, The Fish Can Fly, the other second part of that with a bunch of stuff that's more pertinent to people that live in Canada, there's a bit of a mini win there. That one's coming out right away too. Who was who, Susie? We're on a farm near Francis. I don't even know where that is. <laughs> I'm sure you'll tell me. Where will the care species go after the tank change? Well, I have a couple other tanks that I can move them to. They're just insanely over prolific. Uh, the entire tank is plug full of them. Uh, what I will do is I'll just move them to one of the other tanks. Now, the two 160-gallon tanks, the top one, these are the tanks that uh, the fish are not super productive in yet. Now, the cichlids are just growing up, so there's no really rush on them. Uh, but uh, I could easily throw them into that tank. I would just have to modify the, the overflows so I don't lose any fry to that. And that might, if they don't breed in that water, that'll definitely slow them down. But then all of them can just grow and mature, and then I can disperse them around. And if I have to, I can easily move them into any of the other smaller tanks, and I can put them onto the RO system and then modify the water to my liking for what they need. And then they'll breed their brains out again if I want them. So I always will find a way to get them about. They're already well established in, in the hobby in the States. It's just a matter of whether where you are as to whether or not they're established for you. Uh, they're all over the place. Mr. Rusty Wessel is very, very uh, prolific in, in getting that species out to clubs and to people. So yeah, they're available. 45 million minutes east of Regina. That's like halfway home. You're right, Kyla. Actually, I was approached by a couple people in Canada about uh, putting together a, a follow-up video on the medications more pertaining to something that was more specific to Canada. Canada is, is, a, is a bit of an enigma on how we're going to handle these things because there really isn't a solution right now. When it was implemented, it was implemented because it was following suit to what is being done in Europe. And Europe, that might work great for them because they have all the other protocols and things in place to be able to help people out. But in Canada, we don't have any real fish veterinarians. We just don't. We don't have a strong aquaculture presence because of where we live. Uh, and that's where the, the failing was. And the average hobbyist that is keeping a, a tank full of guppies isn't going to pay the $79.99 or $89.99 vet visit bill to be able to talk to their vet about their sick fish. And the vets aren't necessarily, they, they may ask you to bring the fish in. Well, that's just going to compound the problem even further. So we really don't have a solution for it yet. I don't, I don't have a concrete answer on how to deal with it. I think people just got to start getting a bit more observant, looking at their fish a little bit better. That's not a shot at anybody right now, but uh, I think people got to start watching their fish a little bit better. Every single one of these ailments Short of like buying a bag of fish at an aquarium auction, bring it home, and all of a sudden, boom, the next day you have a problem. I'm talking fish that you have established in your tanks. And if something happens, all of a sudden, be, you'll notice behavioral changes if you're watching your fish long before any signs, physical signs of things will become entrenched or established in your tank. That's been proven time and time and time again. 
I don't drive. I fly. I don't drive anywhere anymore, especially not in Canada. It's too bloody far. It's too bloody far. What is my favorite non-cichlid fish? Well, let's just say it's definitely not a catfish. <laughs> uh, I really, really, really like paradise fish. I would love to access more species of Macropotus. They all breed very, very similar. I've only had uh, a couple of them. The black one, uh, I can't remember the, the species name on it, and I've had a Percularis. But I would love to have Chinensis, one of the spade tail ones. I've never seen it available on any of my lists. It's not saying it's not available. It's just I've never seen it myself. I would love to have any of those. They would rank up there. Uh, I'm one of the few people, apparently according to Kalak, but I've also heard from other people in the world, I'm one of the very few people to have bred successfully the Empire Gudgeon, which is, a, is an Australian species that turns fire engine red. Gudgeon basically in North America translates to goby. Uh, uh, they turn bright, bright red. Uh, I was only successful in doing them outside in tubs with uh, green water. Um, other non-cichlid fishes, well, it'd have to be the other, the Gadeids. I absolutely love the Gadeids as well. So that's good enough for you. I'll give you that. How about that? We do have fish vets in Toronto and Vancouver. Well, yeah, Vancouver definitely would because of the aquaculture aspects of it there. I don't know any of these people personally. I do know people that work at public aquariums. What is your favorite Gadead? My favorite Gadead would probably be Iliadons, and I don't have a specific species, but there was a gentleman local in Winnipeg that kept a tank, 30 or 40 gallon tank of Iliadon Zantushi, I believe it was. And they had everything that all the Gadeads want. They weren't overly aggressive like, say, the Xenotokas. Uh, they got nice and big and chunky, like a good four or five inch fish. They had actually lots of color. Most of the wild Gadeids don't have a lot of color. And uh, these ones had lots of brilliant, brilliant yellow on them and spots and stuff. They, I think they were an absolute stunning fish. I don't know how readily are they available they are within Canada anymore, at least with the circles that I see. But that's a species I would love to be able to introduce back to my tanks at home. I have a Mecha Splendens like crazy. I have the Iliad, those uh, Xenotokas like crazy. I'm sure there's a couple other ones that I'm forgetting about. Um, my other favorite, ooh, there's another favorite. This one's even better because it rhymes with, it's talk about booze, is a, uh, I think it's called Zoogeneticus Zoo tequila. I just call it the tequila live bear. Those are absolutely awesome fish. And I was gifted a trio when I was in the Keystone Clash last September by Joel. He just showed up and gave me a trio of them, and I was pretty, pretty stoked because that's one I'd been looking for for a while. And they were very, very little, but they're well over an inch and a half in size, and they're doing really, really good. I still have the trio, and they're in a 40 breeder with the, the Chetamulensis convict type that I brought back from uh, the wonderful people, uh, Karen Haas and Alan Rowlings, and they're all growing up great. And the Chetamulensis are probably going to start spawning anytime soon, but it's a 40 breeder. There's lots of space and algae and whatnots everywhere, so I think they'll be fine. Can I get your ideas on sponge filters? Porous versus fine. Okay. When I think of sponge filters, it depends on what you're doing. I love the old school hydro sponges, the, the number five in the course, the pro ones, because they were easy to work with. I found any of the finer ones, the, the sponge degrades a lot quicker. That's my personal preference. However, I also love Spencer Jack or, or Stefan Tanner with Swiss Tropicals. These guys have always brought in and accessed uh, the Hamburg Matten filters, the true one. And, and I remember with the Hamburg Matt filter, a three inch of the course, and it was super efficient. But the problem is I had fish in there. I had like 15 inch Bacorti and stuff like that, big Central American cichlids. And when these things go to the bathroom, it's basically the same size as a house cat, not house cat, but what the house cat would produce, got to be clear. And um, these things are just not efficient enough to break that down. And the problem I had with the real coarse ones is when you went to take that sponge out to clean it, literally it emptied itself into the tank. That means the entire tank had to be completely reset. And for that thing, I never really liked them for big, big fish. But any average fish, three, four inches and down, I think they're absolutely, they're absolutely the Cadillac for filtration if you've got an air system. I just wouldn't go super coarse on the mat filters. But hydro sponges, I love the coarser one over the finer one. 
All right, guys, we're well over an hour already. Anybody got any last minute comments or something that they want to say? Otherwise, we're going to see you on Friday night if you're interested. We're going to be in between OFR and Lucas Bretz. I really thank every one of you guys for watching. I really appreciate everything. I appreciate the couple of you guys that uh, that supported me with this super chat feature. I didn't know if I worked or anything, but I, I, I'm absolutely honored by it. So thank you very much, Austin. Thank you. I love all you guys very much. Thank you for everything. And we'll see you on Friday. Night, guys. Take care.